Welcome to the Drake Group's webinar series on critical issues in collegiate athletics. Today's discussion, Millionaires or Minimum Wage, Current and Former Athletes Speak on Athlete Compensation. Our moderator is Katie Lever, Chief Communications Officer for the Drake Group. Welcome everybody to the second webinar in our series, Millionaires or Minimum Wage, Current and Former Athletes Speak Out About College Athlete Compensation. As you all may know, prior to July 1st, which was just eight weeks ago, any college athlete who accepted money in exchange for endorsing a product or service um, uh, to, or, or to use their name, image, and likeness in any way for compensation would have been declared ineligible to play college sports. But today, because of a landmark Supreme Court decision and numerous state laws that have passed allowing college athletes the right to monetize their NILs, college athletes cannot lose their eligibility for doing so, and we're entering a brave new world of outside employment opportunities for college athletes. Our panelists are here to let you know whether college athletes are ready to take advantage of the opportunity. So let me go ahead and introduce them to you really quickly. We are waiting on Mar uh, Maurice Claret, who is an acclaimed author and a former Ohio State football player. Brianna Ellis is a sophomore point guard on the University of New Orleans Privateers women's basketball team and a political science and psychology major. Julian Ross is a fifth year senior running back at Ohio University and a sports management major. And Julie Summer is a former four time NCAA All American swimmer for the University of Texas Longhorns and US national team. And she's currently a lawyer in Seattle. So we're gonna start with a 30 minute panel discussion during which each panelist will respond to a question or two from me. Then we're gonna jump into audience Q and A just like Kirsten said, please use the Q and A feature for that. And starting now, you can submit questions for the Q&A if you would like to. And you can also use the chat room to speak to each other during the panel. Um, I'd also like to add that everybody involved in this panel, everybody you see on the screen right now, is either a current or former college athlete, which is super, super rare in conversations about athlete rights. So we're, we're very pleased for this representation today and really excited to hear what everybody has to say. And on an additional note, today is also Women's Equality Day. So why don't we start off by asking Julie some questions about Title IX. Does that sound good, Julie? Absolutely. I hope uh, Maurice is able to, to join us here quickly, but thank you, Katie. Uh, yeah. Great quality, my great colleague. Happy to be here with you, uh, Brianna, and um, soon to be Maurice and uh, Julian. So um, yeah, happy Women's Equality Day. Uh, great to um, be here and, and, and talk about the issue of gender equity on on this commemorative day, which commemorates the passage of the 19th Amendment uh, for women seeking all rights and privileges, including the right to vote. It celebrates the journey really of women's equality in our socioeconomic structure of our country. And when you bring that back to college sports, uh, we still have a ways to go with regards to Title IX compliance and gender equity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just wanna make sure that everybody's clear that, that Title IX, what's key here to, to remember is that Title IX is separate from NIL rights. Um, hey, Maurice, and uh, it's, so Title IX is a federal law. It's been on the books for almost 50 years. And simply put, it prohibits uh, sex discrimination in education in the United States. It applies to athletics in high school and colleges. It applies um, in terms of both uh, participation and access, as well as other areas on campuses. And it, it's important to point out that the opportunity that I had and that Brianna currently has um, are still not available to every young girl who wishes to pursue her dream of uh, competing at the collegiate level. And separately uh, from NIL rights and gender equity implications, it needs to be noted that there's still widespread gender inequities in college sports. Uh, there's been gains made for sure, you know, 1972 when it was passed, and there's now 10 times more girls and women participating at the high school and collegiate level. Um, uh, but it, uh, since 1972, but even with those hard fought gains, you know, it wasn't just a law passed and it magically, you know, these, these opportunities appeared, people fought for these opportunities after the law passed um, in order for institutions to come into compliance. But even with those hard fought gains, um, according to uh, statistics, um, the organization Champion Women tracks this closely. Uh, there are approximately 90% of colleges and universities still out of compliance. And when you um, look at the scholarships, the scholarships alone, those are actually some really big numbers. And that's just, it's not acceptable in 2021 
Uh, it's, it's not a lack of interest in women's sports. It's not a lack of interest in opportunity. It's a lack of opportunity, period. So it's important to recognize that. And of course, you know, I, I know everybody knows the, the um, well-established benefits of girls and women competing. It's the same thing that men get, right? It's the physical and mental benefits, the self-esteem, the confidence. Um, it's shown actually to show lower rates of depression for girls who participate at a young age, uh, not to mention the educational benefits. Studies show that, that girls graduate uh, from high school at a 20% um, high, a higher rate when they participate in sports. Uh, but again, it's important to note that Title IX is separate from NIL rights, um, and universities still need to comply with Title IX. Mm -hmm. So Julie, before July 1st, there was a lot of speculation about how NIL would be harmful to female athletes because of Title IX. How have female college athletes debunked that myth so far, and what does that say about the marketability of women's sports? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're still very much in the nascency of, of NIL rights. We're, we're less than two months into it. Um, so that I think there's still yet a lot to be seen, but, uh, you know, we knew ahead of time, Katie, that this was also, um, this was uh, good for women, just like it was good for men, right? Um, you know, similar to Title IX, NIL rights are, are about justice and equity, and um, name, image, and likeness rights are, are great for female athletes in the same way that they're great for male athletes. Now, every college athlete has the basic ability uh, to control their own name, image, and likeness. Um, this is um, in, in regards to endorsement opportunities, publicity, uh, as well as self-employment opportunities. And those rights didn't exist um, prior to this year for NCAA athletes. So again, you know, we're still early in the nascency of it, but there's already women are, are benefiting in similar ways that men are, you know, can compare the numbers. But of course, um, you know, that's yet to be seen as to how those really start to start to um, evolve over time. Uh, it's driven by different metrics, social media, um, you know, as athletes are educated in, you know, marketing and, and how to promote themselves and, and how to engage and engage with their communities. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see um, how it evolves, but it, it's going to be good for women, just like it's, it's good, for, good for men. Um, you know, that being said, uh, no rights are, are not a Title IX issue until it is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but I see gender equity coming into play is that um, NIL rights be uh, supported and applied in the same way for both men and women. Mm -hmm. And if you have equal opportunity, of course, um, do you have equitable and ill rights for both men and women? So the issue goes to the foundation of, of equal opportunity uh, at institutions for women, as well as the promotion, the marketing, uh, group licensing deals. Um, you know, institutional marks may be available to all, and that's great. Uh, but, you know, looking at expenditures, looking at um, the opportunities, that also needs to be examined. And so it does come back to scholarships, expenditures, and promotional activities. Uh, you know, you come back to the other flip side of what's happening at, at, at colleges and universities and this unfortunate trend of sports getting cuts. You know, with women and Olympic men's sports, they shouldn't have to sue their school for, for just a fair shake at participating in competing. So, uh, if you're not equitably investing, creating opportunity, promoting, um, or attributing ad revenue even uh, appropriately to, to championships for women, you're, you're setting them up for failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've definitely already seen athletes take advantage of NIL rights. So I want to pivot to Julian now. Um, are athletes excited about NIL opportunities? And have you or your teammates executed any NIL deals so far? Yeah, first I want to say thank you guys for having me. But um, totally. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, um, I think all athletes across the country are actually super excited to be able to um, kind of capitalize based off of what they can do based off on the, either on the field court or pool. But, um, you know, personally, uh, we have had a lot of people on this team do deals. Also, a lot of student athletes across campus as well, especially, you know, uh, just being able to get it within the community. I think that's kind of big first. You know, whenever you're looking at these mid-majors, it's kind of hard to get those huge big deals, obviously. But um, if you're not a five-star recruit, who's going to make 100, 200K, um, you know, you just got to find what's right for you. What also fits, fits your niche, especially. Um, I think that's very important for athletes, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as you and Julie have both kind of alluded to, we're entering 
this uncharted territory, um, you know, where athletes really are kind of, they're on their own, they're also getting some help. Lots of people don't know what to do. Um, and so I wanted to ask Maurice, since you were the first person to challenge the NFL's draft eligibility rules, and now that we're watching the NCAA's amateur status rules crumble, um, are you concerned about unscrupulous agents and advisors kind of blurring the line between collegiate and professional sports? Um, I think that's going to happen. I think that's just a part of it. Uh, the upside for a lot of these guys, um, you know, you guys who go to your, you know, your power five schools, the upside is so strong uh, that I see agents and people just with large sums of money being able to mask deals to these guys to kind of get them affiliated either with uh, some level of sponsorship or just to kind of lock them in to, sh to, to funnel money to them. So um, <clears throat> th that's always went on. Uh, this kind of makes it easier and you can kind of mask it into a, a promotional deal, a marketing deal. Um, you know, you can, you know, I, I've, I've suggested that, you know, if I was in college, I would uh, be getting after people who were in the insurance industry, car dealerships, or people who were within sales. I think that uh, those people would align themselves with athletes relatively fast. And uh, in today's market where everything is virtual, you know, if, you, if you're an agent and you have a ton of money or, you know, a ton of business owners and you want to, you know, get money to an athlete, it's, it's not really hard. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to say I'm scrupulous um, because it, it, it can it can sound like kind of dismissive uh, to agents, and uh, they're they're just being creative with the with the rules that are played. But you better believe that uh, with the amount of money that's being passed around between basketball players, baseball players, football players, and every other sport, uh, that these um, these people will you know go and chase these uh chase these people down. And even with female athletes, you know I don't want to leave those uh, them out. Uh, you see now that. Everybody has a platform. Everybody has a fan base. Everybody has uh, people back in their hometown who rooted for them. And, and if you can garner an audience, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. You know, if you can become a, an entertainment or if, if you can become entertaining, be it on TikTok on, uh, or any of these social platforms where people can sell a product, uh, be it if you have a personality, be it if you're a male or a female, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a level playing field, right? I think the natural... Um, like the natural thing is to say, hey, the guy has more value because he's seen more, he's visualized more. Uh, but, you know, in, in this day and age, when you're just looking to sell products to a, to a certain demographic, if somebody who's trying to sell a product can connect with somebody who's um, connected to an audience that they want to get in front of, you know what I mean? They're going to utilize uh, that player, you know. But even, even if I was a player as well, I want to add this on, just for, even for the young guys thinking, you know, think of things that you can create yourself. You know, think of uh, if you have a if you have a moniker, a name, a nickname, uh, you have different products, you know, you over there in Athens, you know, there's a group of people who always love those kids uh, when they're playing down there at OU or whatever university that they're at. And, you know, you don't have to hit a home run. You don't have to make, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars for a deal, you know, for you to pick up, you know, just uh, additional money into your um, what is it called? The um, uh, cost of attendance money. You know, if you can pick up, you know, four five, six, seven, eight grand uh, monthly just from, you know, managing different deals and you can either put that money up or put it into the market or, you know, get into some other investments, you know, uh, because most guys won't go. I think that stuff can serve these young guys well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, the focus of this panel series is mostly on name, image, and likeness, but the Drake Group and LRT Sports both believe that name, image, and likeness is only the beginning of college sports reform and that there are many, many more issues that we need to address in order to reform college athletics. So I want to pivot to Brianna now and ask her, what reforms do you think are necessary to put college sports back on track? Hi, I was going to say thank you for having me. Um, there's a few, um, that I just, that I kind of pick up on. I'm, I don't know everything, but just from being an athlete and just looking in my shoes, um, one of the biggest things that I would say for college athletes, and this is only at my university, you know, I don't know how it is at other universities, but we're pretty, um, adamant about having like balance between, you know, athletes time and, and athletics and also like time for themselves, you know what I mean? And so, um, I know the University of New Orleans were pretty were pretty good on that, but that's not the case for a lot of colleges, whether it be Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. Um, it's really heinous, like a lot of athletes that are going through a lot of mental health issues and depression and anxiety, just trying their best to balance school and to balance family and to balance, you know, being away from home and whatever the case may be. So um, I, I would suggest that there should be more form in that aspect that is taking care of our athletes because 
we kind of sometimes some of us are seen as just being an athlete and being here for four years and then we, we're off and then they get the next person to recruit when we're, we're more than that we're human and it's really important that we take our mental health serious and especially in the collegiate level it is not a game it is very competitive and it requires the best of the best so that's just one of the reforms that I would like want to pursue and hopefully see a change in when it comes to college athletics and um uh this is just me just thinking in the air but I know that you know with the NCAA with the NIL um how you know athletes are starting to you know promote themselves and get their brand out there um I think it would be a really great idea maybe um if athletes say they win a conference championship or say they win the whole thing um to get some level like some type of pension with that um since they work so hard and they dedicate their time and and their efforts into competing i feel as though that they should be rewarded in some way shape or form from the ncaa so those are just my ideas but um yeah <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Julian, do you see any issues in college sports that need reform? I would say it would be kind of beneficial would be a just a, um, a student athlete kind of union base, to get, just so, uh, you know, we can all just kind of come together and find out what, what what's needed within each conference or whatever, just have the opportunity to kind of just face, you know, especially like mental health. I know Brianna kind of touched on that, which is actually a very big deal, but just have an opportunity to really kind of speak our mind and have a conclusion based off what we would like to see. I think that'd be helpful. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that. And I'd like to toss this one up to anybody who'd like to answer. Can the NCAA be trusted with these reforms or do we need an outside influence, like maybe congressional pressure to get the job done? Oh, I was, <laughs> I would say um, definitely congressional pressure. Um, it's, I feel like they would recognize it, but they wouldn't take as much like, initiative with it. And so I feel like having that congressional push would definitely provide a little bit more initiative and um, urgency. What about you, Maurice? You've pushed back against rules before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, God bless the NCAA, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want them to continue to be in charge of what's going on. Um, you know, I, I just, I think you need some level of congressional pressure. I went to Washington fighting for this thing. Uh, this was right before COVID had hit. And uh, what, what, like this, I don't know, it's kind of like a, a crazy moment to even be on this panel to hear these uh, younger people talk about this, uh, that this is actually changing. It's actually a thing. Uh, this wasn't a thing 20 years ago. It makes me feel old when I say it, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, uh, but j just to see how things have changed, but you know, I don't, the NCAA can't be in charge of this. You need a third party entity who doesn't have a vested interest who can just say, hey, uh, let me let me give advice or let me uh, reward kids or govern this thing appropriately based upon just viewing it as an independent entity. Uh, the NCAA has uh, benefited greatly and largely off the backs of these kids uh, for a number of years. Uh, and there's there's been there's been a value exchange and the argument has been uh, what, what is the what is the worth of the exchange? But to um, to ask, answer your previous question, I think reform needs to start. You know, don't, I don't never want to miss this. Uh, it's only education that saved my life. And I think that uh, the, the athletes at every university I've been to, and I've been to a ton of them, uh, I don't want to say every, I'll say probably 98% of them, right? Um, they, they don't get an adequate education. Uh, they, they major in eligibility. Uh, and most of these uh, young people, when they come on campus, they think that they're manipulating the system. Uh, but you have an academic support staff who are filtering these kids into these uh, nonsense majors. And once they graduate and go back to their hometowns, they have nothing to offer more than football camps, basketball camps, and, and nothing else. They don't, uh, they're, and, they're, and, and it's, this goes on uh, more than anything else. You know, maybe that may help to combat mental health issues that you're actually um, improving your, you know, improving just the totality of yourself and you're able to introduce, the work, introduce yourself to the workforce as a complete human being rather than uh, just an athlete who's been shuffled into classes just to stay eligible. So if I can if I can speak to one thing in reform before money, before anything, uh, all that stuff comes as you improve yourself, but we need to do a better job of holding coaches and academic support staffs uh, more accountable with the course selection that they give to these kids that does absolutely nothing for them when they graduate. Yeah, the Drake group is all about educational reform. So I'd like to bring it back to Julie um, and talk about gender equity reform, because you mentioned earlier um, that as 
the NIL landscape becomes the new normal, that gender equity might become an issue. How would that become an issue and what can universities do to level the playing field? Where I see it, again, you know, we're, we're still in the, the early, early nascency of NILs here, but I, where I see it coming in play is, again, the, just the foundation of the equity, equitable opportunities for women um, and the promotion, the marketing, uh, the educational side of that, the support of it. Um, so supporting female athletes as well. Uh, and then, um, you know, it, it could get tricky in some of the group licensing deals. Uh, so that'll be interesting to examine. Um, but I think coming back to that, um, it, it, to second uh, what Maurice said too, is that I think congressional action is, um, for so many reasons, it's what, what we really need at this moment. Um, you know, the, the problems are profound in, in college sports, way beyond name, image, and likeness. Um, I think just that rollout shows how profound the problems are. And, uh, you know, beyond just a narrow NIL policy, uh, you know, we have these so many varying state laws right now. Obviously, we're going to need a, a uniform national policy on that. But um, I think for, for what's at stake, it would be a mistake to only address a narrow nil policy and, and walk away. That's not the whole story here. We have um, so many problems uh, and instances through the years in, in different areas, which show the need for a, a hard look at, at college sports uh, and the college sports system. You know, from an academic standpoint, like Maurice just discussed, uh, health and safety, racial, social, gender equity. Um, and this is in addition to the crit critical need for, for clarity on, on name, image, and likeness policy. We, we definitely need federal action. And um, you know, they've, the NCAA is basically declared independence right now from nil restrictions. Yeah. So this burden uh, is now falling on the institutions and I'm sure they didn't want that. This wasn't, this wasn't what they had in mind. Um, and that burden is you know, uh, uh, falling on compliance directors. This is, this, their job is already overwhelming. So to put this on them and to be in this area right now, it's, um, it's obviously unworkable in the, long, in the long term. So we need to not only um, consider the short term benefits of, of revenue generation of NIL rights, but also look at the, the long-term protections and support, which are so needed um, you know, for these young people making the sacrifices of their bodies, of their minds, and of their time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And to be clear, name, image, and likeness activity is not the same as athletes being paid directly for participating in their sport. Um, so Maurice, I'd like to ask you one more question. Should athletes get paid cash like the pros to play college sports or are colleges and universities awarding scholarships limited to educational expenses the right way to go? I think it should be a combination of both. Um, they, they both have different value. Um, if you, I don't want to get too deep and in, in, um, move the needle, uh, but I don't think that these guys actually get education. You know, I think that they are in classes uh, to become uh, eligible in most cases. If you actually did uh, a study on that, more people are just there to be eligible than they are to be educated. So I don't, I don't have a, a lot of value in, 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 in saying that that's a fair exchange uh, because I was a part of the system and I'm still, I travel to university, university, I speak to people all the time. And I ask them what classes that they're in, and they only tell me what classes that they're in. I just kind of laugh in the back of my brain, and I say this is the same thing going on. Uh, but they're, but I definitely believe they should be paid, and they should be paid like any other human being uh, in this world. If you are a part of a system, and we could take any, just take any industry, if you are a part of driving revenue to the bottom line of anything, you should be compensated accordingly based on your value to that, right? And so I, <clears throat> for us to make it a thing is a thing. Right. I don't I don't see how we don't understand that if you are going to go in higher education, somebody will look at your resume. Somebody will say this person has this value uh, to this department. And then based on their experience and tenure and what they feel that they can market that professor or whoever it is, they'll you know, they'll pay them accordingly. You know, if I want to be in you know, any industry in America, we also we all get that. Uh, but you have the smartest, some of the smartest people in the world uh, who deal in athletics, who deal in education and who do this for a living. And they act like it's so hard to create a value and to pay a person. Uh, and I find it like, I find it laughable that we even are even having this conversation, um, which makes me always get to the thing to say, hey, why is it hard to pay all these black kids, right? Because it goes there. And it actually says that, you know, if, if a kid was playing baseball, if they're playing hockey and they play these club sports and they got compensated in a thousand different ways, um, it wouldn't be an issue. But when it comes to becoming playing these young black kids, uh, it just becomes an issue, you know, and, I, and I, I'm not the one, you'll never hear me on any platform ever talk about anything with racial 
anything. I'm just not, I don't get into that conversation because it's like the never ending conversation. You know, if somebody has racial issues, they'll just have them, right? Uh, but it makes me think and it makes me wonder when it comes to this, uh, is, is that a problem? You know what I'm saying? And so my, my short answer is yes, but I don't think that the education that these people uh, receive is of equivalent value. All right, thank you all so much for your insight so far. We're about at that 30 minute mark and we have some really fantastic questions in the Q&A. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with that. Thank you everyone who has submitted questions and you can still do so if you have any um, that you haven't submitted yet. Um, there's one uh, from Jerry Tipton here in the Q&A and I'd like to ask uh, Julian and Brianna this question. Um, how disruptive could NIL be in a locker room? Is jealousy a possibility? And if so, how should it be dealt with? Let's start with you, Julian. Um, you know, honestly, um, when it comes to the NIL, NIL deals and kind of just making money, um, you know, there's always just that kind of that universal rule that you just kind of don't count anybody else's pocket. Yeah. And so, you know, there hasn't really been, you know, from personally, it hasn't been any issues whatsoever in, in our locker room that I'm having you know, with the football team. I, don't, I haven't heard of anything around campus. But um, I don't see NIL being a big deal uh, towards jealousy or, you know, causing any conflict within the team because, um, you know, every person can create value for themselves. And so I know we had talked about that earlier, but just having that niche, being able to be able to promote yourself either on social media or going out there and starting your own business, you know, you have that same opportunity that anybody else does. And so, you know, you just have to be able to capitalize on top of it. So it always does come down to that, you know, just don't look at anybody else's pocket at the end of the day. Mind your own business. That's always good advice. <laughs> what about you, Brianna? What do you think? I would have to agree with Julian because we're a little bit older. Like we still are kids to uh, other adults, but we're also an adult enough to understand money and understand that our brands are all different. Somebody could be making money off of modeling. Somebody could be a brand ambassador. Somebody could have their own clothing line or you know, home decor company. So we all have different niches and that's kind of like what the whole, you know, whole focal point is, is just to find out what your brand is. And so you find that and then you make your own money off of that. However much money you make, it really shouldn't matter. And there really isn't any jealousy because at the end of the day, I mean, my team, we're all teammates. And so we care about each other. We want to make sure that we see each other succeed. And that's all the NIL is. It's just to find a way to succeed outside of just our cost of attendance money and our tuition being paid off in our books. So yeah, there isn't really any jealousy when it comes to NIL. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. I heard that a lot leading up to July 1st that, oh, we shouldn't pass NIL because it's going to cause drama in the locker room. So it's nice to hear that that's definitely not the case. Um, so kind of going back to the broader conversation of college sports reform, um, there's a question from Connie Zotos and uh, Julie, I think you'll be a good person to answer this one. Do you think that coach abuse of athletes, physical, mental, or emotional is a rare or significant problem in college athletics? And do you feel like you can report coach abuse to the administration without retaliation? I'm sorry, you say Julianne or Julie? Oh, Julie, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was gonna actually direct that to Julian, you, <laughs> since he's a current athlete. Um, yes, I, I, I uh, think that's an issue. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm less inclined to report. Could you clarify that? Sorry, Katie. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? I wanted, I'm sorry, I wanted you to clarify the, the part about reporting to coaches. Oh yeah, do you feel that athletes can report coach abuse to the administration without retaliation? I think that's tricky. Um, I think in, in a lot of cases and in, in certain institutions, um, they don't feel comfortable doing that. You know, there's, uh, there's been issues in the past where, um, you know, who is, who is the Title IX office? Where are they? Are there anyone, is the person in charge of that? Do they actually have any type of pre-existing relationship with the athlete? So do they know them? Do they feel comfortable going to that person uh, and, and reporting, you know, whatever the issue might be? Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that's an issue. I think it's an ongoing issue. And I would be curious to hear um, maybe what, what Julian and Brianna, uh, what their thoughts might be on that, whether or not they have, you know, actual personal experience with it or anybody that they know. You know, um, I would say, um, I was reading the question, but now it's gone, but um, 
personally, I, you know, I haven't seen anything of, of that sort here at Ohio University, but um, obviously I can't speak for all the other universities and student athletes across the country. And so if, you know, I know it'd be difficult to, to report that type of thing, especially if you're considering certain situations like, oh, my playing time will go down a bit more, or, or I won't do this, or I won't be able to get this, or whatever the situation, it's kind of just that power over the student athlete. But, um, you know, in order to kind of just take that power back, you just kind of, you have to do what you need to do. And that is report to administration. But um, in, in terms of, you know, are coaches allowed to do these type of things or should they do this type of things? Do they do these type of things? I hope not because, I mean, if you're going to go out here and coach student athletes, you have to have a love and passion to be able to interact with these student athletes. And so I hope that's not, not the case whatsoever. Yeah, and Katie, really quickly, I know I'm not formally on the panel, but just wanted to bring up LRT Sports for those of you that don't know. So we're actually a rating review platform for college coaches. So any athletes that are feeling like there might be retaliation from an administration or anything, they can come and write reviews about college coaches and it's completely anonymous. So if an administration decides to check out our website or see anything, they can kind of go to our website and see how the players are feeling about the coaches and the players have a safe space to speak anonymously. Um, and we also do a lot of content creation whether players choose to remain anonymous or tell stories later, or even while they're at their time about mental health and coach abuse situations or anything. And that is something that we have been doing since 2014 now. So that's something that we're very passionate about. And Katie knows that too, but just wanted to interject and interject on that uh, specifically. Brianna, I have a question that I'd like to hear you answer because when you were talking about your ideas for reform, you emphasize mental health. Um, so Annabelle Carter has a question. Um, will universities be required to provide each athlete with mental health services? I'd like to rephrase that and ask, is that the solution to this, to the problem of college athlete mental health issues? It is requiring universities to provide uh, athletes with mental health services? I think it's a good start, but I don't think it's the main solution. Um, even there's a lot of resources here on our campus and there's still a, a few, actually a lot of athletes who still don't feel comfortable um, going to those mental health resources, even though that is confidential. Um, I would say just get digging a little deeper um, with our athletes, forming a connection, because if you have these mental health resources, it kind of feels like, oh, man, I'm talking to somebody that I've never spoken to ever in my life, and I have to tell them my business. So um, just having, whether it's the coaching staff, whether it's somebody um, with the athletic staff um, to talk to, whether it be a teammate, um, whether I know our coach one day, she just said, hey, there's no practice today. We're just gonna have a mental health day. And we went, we're in New Orleans. So we went down to City Park and we had beignets and we just had a moment to just relax and, and not be an athlete for a day. And that sounds kind of bad, but it's still good in a sense because we're still human. We're still people. We still get burnt out. We have a lot of classes. We have to manage a lot of things. And so just having days like that, not necessarily a full day, but just little moments like that where we can connect together um, to talk to somebody and know that we're not alone in these situations is, is really essential in order for us to improve our mental health as athletes. And um, the resources, that's a good start, but just getting a little bit deeper would definitely help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I know the audience signed up for an NIL panel tonight. There's just so much we can talk about in the broader sense of college sports reform. Um, and Carl has a really good question here in the Q&A about the broader, or the broader discussion of college sports reform. Um, how do we hold university presidents and provosts accountable in these reform efforts? Maurice, why don't you go ahead and answer that one? That's a tricky one. I really don't have a good answer for it. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't. Um, how do you hold them accountable? Into into what specifically? Um, just into making sure that they're looking out for the health and safety and just overall wellness of college athletes, and and you know NIL included in that as well. Yeah, it's tricky because like there's a part of me that just says that they don't really care. You know. Um, and that more revenue generation and more winning, the winning games is like what really matters uh, probably to the AV, to the athletic director. Um, you know, um, winning games helps to increase the profile, which helps to increase the attendance, which helps to increase the businesses around the, 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 um, the stadium. And uh, I don't know, I know a lot of people commercially sit it there for this stuff, but a lot of people don't care. You know, uh, that, that's why you have it just sort of like this 
uh, willy nilly freestyling thing at this point. Like there's nobody who's coming out and said, hey, let me grab this thing by the horns. Uh, so I don't know. I don't I don't really have a good answer. I don't like to give um, answers to things that I don't really have answers to. <laughs> no worries. What about you, Julie? What do you think? There's so many things that, that you know that I would want to express uh, to the college presidents as, as to why they should care about these issues. Um, you know, all around, just uh, the profound you know reform that needed that is so needed beyond just name, image, and likeness policy. Um, you know, we're all here because we know we care about uh, the value of college sports and the college sport experience. And you know, just want to know on a personal note uh, about Maurice. Um, you know, I'm, I'm someone who also grew up in a small Eastern Ohio town, downstate, downriver, and even smaller, you even smaller than Youngstown, <laughs> and where, where Maurice grew up. And, and Maurice is such a great example uh, of a former college athlete, an extraordinarily talented athlete. Um, but he's also a, a remarkable example of, of the college athlete experience. Um, you know, we all know we go through it uh, in, in college sports. We're all former or current college athletes, the work, the physical, the mental, the, the demands, the sacrifice, dealing with pressure. And um, what Maurice took and learned from that experience uh, about himself is now giving back and he's changing people's lives. He's helping adults, he's helping children, you know, with centers that he's opened in his hometown of, of Youngstown in Columbus. And it's a ripple effect in our society of opportunity and empowerment. He's now empowering other people's lives. And does it get any better than that? So I just think, you know, if we can have a, a really a strong collective voice uh, that comes together and expresses all of these issues that, that really need to be addressed, um, uh, you know, regarding the NCA, regarding uh, the, the institutions that, um, you know, we, we take this to the congressional effort. Um, you know, we need transparency, we need uh, financial responsibility uh, as we seek equity as, and as we, you know, seek preserving a healthy, sport opportunity mm -hmm. can i say something yeah go for it yeah um this was i think it was uh, with brianna i think it was a question that she answered um I've, I've been advocating for a while for more athletes to get into the social work space um i definitely understand when they say that they they don't feel comfortable engaging with uh therapists social workers or counselors uh, i think that there just may be a lifestyle disconnect and with so much miseducation of our athletes I wish more athletes would actually go through um, social work counseling courses. Uh, it would help to figure themselves out. But then after, I think I wish the university would employ uh, sort of like some peer to peer support. I think that that would be uh, advantageous to athletes feeling connected to somebody who understands the process. Uh, I still go to a therapist on a regular basis. And I just understand, like, even as a 37 year old adult, I still feel a disconnect from somebody who I know is a professional and I'm actually in the industry and I, Hire, I hire counselors and social workers and everything. Uh, but when there's a, um, a, a social disconnect or just a, a lifestyle disconnect, you just don't feel comfortable. Or you, you only get so far with certain people. And so if there's anything that I push, I, I, want, I wish more athletes, I wish universities say, hey, you know, let's, let's get these kids down a social work path and let's sort of create uh, some opportunities for them to help athletes throughout their journey. Uh, and they have the resources to do this stuff if they really wanted to do it, if they really cared about um like you know, just the development of these kids, you know, post sports, you know what I mean? And that's, that's just my two cents on it. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, um, you know, because from my experience as a college athlete, mental health can be very tricky because you're, you know, you're balancing school and you're balancing your sport and there's a lot of performance anxiety and just general stress that a lot of people don't understand. And then also as an athlete, you, you know, you're always taught to be tough and to gut it out. And so sometimes seeking help for, for something that, is really hard to describe sometimes, um, can be difficult. And we have a good question in the chat about NIL and mental health. Um, and I'd like to ask this to Julian and Brianna because they're kind of in the thick of NIL right now, um, but how might NIL impact students' mental health? Could it add possible financial stress or could it possibly improve their students' lives and their families' lives? Brianna, why don't we start with you? I say it could be a little bit of both, depending on the person. I feel as though if you're not responsible with money, um, this could be a big downfall. Or if you are, then this could be really, really great. 
Um, I think it's more of a positive side though, um, as far as making money and you know establishing your brand and what people want. You can influence a lot of people off of this, um, whether it be whatever your brand is. So let's say for me, big mental health. Uh, and so if I was you know, to really make money off of that, then I could potentially influence a bunch of people through social media and that could help others, you know, and with their mental health and that could just be a ripple effect. So it could honestly just, it could be a really great thing and you could really develop a big brand for yourself and you can make a lot of money and you can influence others or it could really be your downfall if you're not smart with it or if you don't have the right people in your circle to help you with this situation. So it really just depends on how you look at it. Julian, how about you? Like Brianna had talked about, you know, the good things about it, but I know we had touched upon, um, you know, possible negative effect of it is obviously you, when you are counting someone else's pocket. And so uh, when you look at it, you're comparing yourself and what you're making and whatever, whatever deal someone else has, um, that obviously will cause some sort of strain because you start to feel as if you're not on the same level as them or you start to feel as if you're not doing as well. And so I think that right there would just cause financial stress within itself. But, you know, as Brianna did touch upon, um, also not having, you know, some sort of financial knowledge or background behind it. And so I think it's important that we could try to do something like that. I know most universities and uh, organizations sometimes don't have the funding to do that. And so I know uh, some coaches will step up and try to provide that type of opportunity for student athletes. But um, overall, I think NIO could impact a student athlete's mental health. I think anything could impact a student athlete's mental health as we are balancing so much every single day and just trying to just live our lives. But um, I think, you know, just having the basic knowledge behind and uh, financial uh, knowledge as well, but also, you know, maintaining a balance and understanding and being comfortable in who you are and what you're able to do and being able to create value for yourself in that and not looking at someone else's pocket it definitely will kind of you know, bring down your own stress level a bit. Mm -hmm. Julian, you gave me the best segue to this next question, talking about everything that college athletes have to balance, um, because Sandy Thatcher has a question in the Q&A about um, balancing educational obligations with NIL opportunities. Um, so Julie, I'd like you to answer this one. Now, with the addition of NILs to a practice schedule that eats deeply into time left for education, will the status of education for athletes be getting worse? I don't think so, no. I think, and again, I think this is also uh, really closely adjacent to mental health. Um, it's, about, it's about balance, right? And um, you're only gonna have nil opportunities coming in if you're focusing as a student and doing, doing well and staying eligible and doing well in your sport. So the focus should come first on your academics, uh, you know, doing your sport, doing the best you can, and then that comes as a result. And, um, you know, mental health is, is not a new concern with, with name, image, and likeness rights. If, if people are going to start saying that, I, I, I think it's important to note that, of course, it's going to be you know, a balancing act, but it's what you make of it, again. And I think, um, you know, making sure that athletes are educated in this area is, is really important. Uh, I think it, it would be disingenuous to say, um, if anyone's going to detract from Nils, uh, to say that, uh, you know, that's going to be a breaking point, you know, on the, on the mental side, it, that's a concern all along. Um, mental is such a much more broader issue, uh, you know, in terms of health and safety, um, you know, how they're doing in general, how they're doing with, with balancing, how they're doing in their sport, how their mental health is generally not, you know, I don't think Nils is going to be the straw that, that, that breaks the back in terms of that, um, or in terms of balance. So, um, I would say athletes are really good at balancing things. So, you know, this is just a, a benefit that they're now uh, availed that has always been availed to every other student on campus. So, um, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, Maurice, what do you think about that? Um, just the complications of balancing NIL with educational obligations. I don't, like I say, I always look at the bottom line of everything. And with everything, the bottom line is for these universities to make money and win games. And um, these head coaches have so much pressure to do that. Um, and with that being a factor, they drive a large part of these athletes' behavior. And everybody thinks that they're going to play pro and everybody's going to think that they'll have an opportunity to do something more during the current state, right? And so, like, um, there's a natural imbalance that's going to come with that understanding what the motivation is or what the bottom line is. The bottom line is to generate revenue, to get fans, to put people in seats, and 
Uh, it just it's, it's a complicated thing, and I don't I don't ever think that there will be balance, right? Unless you gave the coach uh, a twenty year contract, you say, hey, you'll be here forever, whether you win, lose, or draw. We're just here to develop uh, uh, young men and women, and and everything will be wholesome. Uh, that will be a thing. The coach would think th different about the development of the athlete if it was their kid inside of another sport. They would care about all these things, but just the structure, like there's no alignment within college sports, right? And the motivate, like everything we're talking about on this panel, everybody knows it makes sense, right? Everybody knows it makes sense to take care of people. Everybody knows you have to uh, not put these athletes in a super pressurized situation to where you make them go crazy. Uh, but then on the flip side of the coin, the incentive for the people who are in charge of them is to do all of those things. And they only know to drive the athlete more, to drive the, uh, to, 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 to put them in the easiest classes so there's no strain, to make the name, image, and likeness thing not another factor that they have to fight against for an athlete's time. And uh, they say, hey, you know, this guy could possibly have an ego or this girl could possibly have an ego with these things. And they don't want those things uh, as a result in their mix. And so I don't, I don't ever think that there will be balance, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't want to sound like like Debbie Downer or like the harsh guy, but I just always I, I look at like what's what's the bottom line of everything? The bottom line is money. You know, with all these universities, with everybody who's talking about this, the bottom line is money. They say who's incentivized that? The 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 athletic director's job is to go out and raise funds. The head coach's job is to win, so he has something to market, right? So the coach is saying, you know, hey, Julie and Brianna, y'all in here, y'all have to win, 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 win. So we have something to market to go get donations, right? So the coach isn't coming to say. And, and here's the fine balance. I was thinking about this earlier when we were talking. I was a guy that you can like, you know, you can yell at me and coach me hard. And I just came from that culture where I didn't care, right? And so I probably went crazy a few times. I didn't know it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It just wasn't a thing that you knew, knew that was going on. But now you have uh, people who are more aware that, you know, the stress, anxiety, and, and, and the, the, the long-term effects of what somebody's uh, verbal abuse can do to you. Everybody didn't come up the same way. Um, how that can impact the player, you know, now these things become a thing, but I'm pretty sure these coaches don't want to deal with that. A lot of these coaches who are in position, they're old school coaches. Let me get in your butt. Let me get in your face. Let me yell at you. Let me develop you. Um, and I don't know. So, so I don't know. I have conflicted feelings about it, but to, to answer your question is I don't think that there'll ever be any balance. And uh, you put name, image, and likeness into the mix. I just think it just, um, a lot of coaches are not warm to it. You know, go listen to Dabble Sweeney. Yeah, and um, just to kind of go off of that about balance and education as it pertains to NIL, it's also important that college athletes are educated about how to, um, you know, monetize their NILs while staying within the rules and financial literacy is very, very important. And so we have a question, a couple of questions from Brian Soso. Um, are your schools doing NIL training or 101 prep? Or are you having to do all the research yourself? I am going to toss this to the panelists, but I will say that LRT Sports has resources for this. So, um, Kirsten, I don't know if you'd you would want to put that link in the in the chat, but we do have resources designed to educate college athletes. Um, but what about the actual college athletes right now? Are your schools doing any kind of training for NIL, Julian? Um, so we haven't really got too much into training with it, like as if, uh, but we have had certain talks about it, you know, certain things that we can be and can and cannot do within it. And so uh, not certain training, but uh, just a lot of covering of the rules and definitely what, what opportunities you definitely can have. Mm -hmm. What about you, Brianna? Yeah, we, we've had a long discussion about monetizing, you know, our name, image, and like this through compliance. And we have, I think we have to take a financial literacy course, like every athlete has to take that now. So we're, once we heard the news, you know, from NIL and, you know, monetizing off our name, image, and like this, we took the course of action to take, you know, classes and to be educated on what is going on. Yeah, and we have another question about NIL education from David Ridpath, who asks, uh, what are the best ways a university can help athletes and students deal with NIL rights and income? Um, so why don't we start with Julie on that one? No, I'll, I'll echo what's, what's already been said in terms of, of education, um, you know, for you, we're hearing a lot about the high profile athletes, right, getting the, the six figure deals, but we've also heard statistics that the average uh, nil income uh, so far, again, we're less than two months into it, has been about $471 a month. Uh, that was for July um, with, with the top athletes, um, you know, may uh, be making the, the six figure deals. 
that 88% of it's driven by social media. Um, it's mostly um, been in football, but um, again, I, you know, we're still very early on. We're going to see it happening in other sports, and uh, you know, as we've already discussed, driven by um, how people brand it and market themselves. Um, I think it's it's important um, for athletes to make sure they're taking advantage of the right deals, the right opportunities, rather than um, every deal that comes along their way. And again, that just goes back to education. Uh, so uh, you know, it's an, it's important that's but that's done right. And I hope that, um, you know, we get a, we get a good federal policy soon um, so that we know we have a little more direction than, than what we have right now driven in our, our state system uh, and the hands-off approach to by the NCA currently. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Maurice? What are some steps that universities can take to help educate athletes about NIL? Uh, I think what they're doing thus far I'm um, sorry. Uh, I think what they're doing thus far with uh, giving basic education that they will probably give any other student, I think, is the first step. Uh, one thing I was thinking about, I think that they can go out and grab the nature of probably the, the five to ten deals uh, that other athletes are getting or have benefited from. And I think that they should walk them do, through deal flow. Uh, athletes don't have a lot of hands on experience with just working through deals, working through contracts, understanding their own value. Like if somebody hit them up and said, hey, I, wanna, I want you to send a tweet out, there is no market to say what a tweet is worth or how do you how do you put a valuation on yourself? I think they should walk through stuff like that. Um, I think you bring a small business owner, just like these, these, uh, these young guys and girls are small businesses, right? And I think you should talk about small business. I think you should talk about credit. I think you should talk about establishing credit. And, you know, through financial literacy, like I, I would be interested to see what that actually looks like because that's a whole scope. You can go from... Uh, understanding banking to understanding credit to understanding uh, just uh, what's coming in and and out of your account. Um, there, there's there's just a ton of stuff. Put money into the market. Uh, just understanding what the market is. Um, there, there's a ton of things that you can teach uh, young men and women. And I can give my advice uh, just from personal experience and what I've done to to build my life up. But I think uh, even bigger than that, it's just deal flow. Like if if a guy has gotten um, uh, let, let's say a deal with an insurance company. What did that look like? How much was it worth? Why was his value this? What did he do to generate the income? What was his responsibility? You go through the same thing through cars, right? If you want to approach a car company, this is so how you can represent yourself. If you want to do an autograph session for yourself, this is what the market bears for you. You know, you all can get together as a group of players. You don't need an agent. You can advertise to your own social media, drive the traffic yourself, buy pictures yourself, make sure they're licensed, sell stuff yourself. There's a, there's a thousand different ways that these uh, young men and women can do it. Uh, but like I said, I laugh when they when they both said they've got basic information, but they have nobody on the university saying, hey, let me teach you how to do it. Right. There's no way that they would go hire a coach and to say, hey, coach, you figure it out. They would say, hey, let me teach you how to coach. Let me t let me find out where you live at. Let me create an environment where you can succeed at. You know what I'm saying? So just the nature of them not engaging is like, yo, you figure it out. But how are you going to figure it out if you're practicing all day? <laughs> you know what I'm saying you're not going to figure it out. You know what I mean? You're going to be practicing, and then you're going to be playing, and then you say, "Okay, I got the end of the day." Uh, but if, but like, if this was, uh, if this was important to them, they would do all of it. Like, like when I say these universities have has an immense amount of resources. I don't care if you had a mid major. I don't care where you at. Universities have resources. They have people. They have donors. They have. Um, they, they have infrastructure to teach these young people what they're what they need to do. And the reason I'm the reason I get so passionate about it is because I understand the mathematics. Most people won't go to the professional level. It's just the reality of it. You know what I'm saying? So teaching yourself, I, I'll say this too. This is another thing. I'm pretty sure a lot of these young people don't even not, they, they don't have a clue that their scholarships are donations. They're donated to the school, right? And uh, like the guy who um donated my scholarship to Ohio State. Um, he owned 19 pharmacies. Just think about the education I could have got from a guy who owned 19 pharmacies. If we were connected for three or four years and then say football didn't work out, now I have a, a, an established relationship with the local business owner. Now his network becomes my network. And if he's paid for me to go to school for three or four years and I didn't make it, I'm pretty sure that he would uh, advocate for me to basically have some sort of success after I'm done playing football because he loves the university. So Listen to me, I could talk about this stuff all day and all night because my, my life was personally affected by it. But there's a thousand ways that these young people can make money, but you have to have a group of people who want to incentivize these people to make money and they have to want to see these people do well. And if that doesn't happen, then you won't create an environment for it. 
yeah, I wish we could talk longer about this, but we're pushing up against um, seven, seven o'clock my time, eight o'clock Eastern. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, coming out tonight. We do have time for one more question. So I'm gonna make our rounds with one final question. Um, but before I do that, um, we do encourage audience members to click on the Drake group link provided in the chat room. Kirsten's gonna go ahead and post that. Um, and at the end of our program to learn more about what we do and how you can support our efforts. And we'll be sending all of the audience members um, information on our end of September webinar. And our topic is still to be determined, but something to do with critical issues in college sports. So make sure you all are keeping an eye out for that. And the final question, which is a good one from Preston Tracy in the Q&A. Do you think that the NCAA will always be the governing body of collegiate athletics, or is it possible that schools will branch off and create a new NCAA? Julie, what do you think? There's definitely a lot of ideas being thrown out right now, um, which are, um, you know, good to be examining. Yet another reason for <laughs> Congressional Commission to examine these issues. Um, and uh, I, I don't know what the ultimate answer is uh, on that. I don't think just a rebrand of the NCA is really anything that's that's going to profoundly change anything. Um, I think uh, you know it really needs to be a deep a deep look at at the issues in college sport and and um, you know, think about it, it, you know, the different issues that have already been offered in our, even our earlier panel last week. Um, so I, I think um, it's possible, but I think the best, the best way to do that is um, perhaps not have the NCA do it themselves and, and, and do the self-examination at this point, um, but uh, have experts in a, in a Blue Ribbon Commission to really study these issues um, that we all care about very much. Uh, and, and, and inform them and um, and uh, have, have that at the congressional level. Mm -hmm. Brianna, what about you? What might the future of college sports look like? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know if it'll branch off. That's that's a big stretch. That would, a lot of hairs would have to be pulled in that situation. It's a lot of conversations. Um, for the most part, for my four years of playing college basketball, I'm sure the NCAA is going to stay the NCAA. But who knows? Um, with enough action, with enough conversation, it could branch off. It's just it's just a matter of you know who knows. I don't I don't have the answer. Julian, what do you think? I'll kind of follow behind what Maurice had stated earlier. Um, he doesn't answer questions. He doesn't have a full answer to, <laughs> and so I'll kind of just follow behind that one over there. How about you, Maurice? Do you have a crystal ball? Yeah, I think you're watching. You're watching what happens, what is going to happen in front of your face. When you're seeing the SEC expand with uh, Texas and Oklahoma, I think that's a sign that uh, the bigger conferences are getting with themselves and they're saying, "Hey, you have to understand the business of it, right? All this stuff is revenue. All this stuff is driven by the TV. So the SEC is basically saying, "Hey, we don't need the NCAA. We can play games ourselves. We can uh, advertise on our network ourselves, and we'll do that." Then you had the Big Ten, the ACC, and the Pac-12 get together, and they said, hey, we're going to form an alliance, right? And what that meant was that we're going to create bowl-like games or games that basically bring in more revenue and gets us uh, better TV contracts with each other and enlarges our, our fan base, our, 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 um, our customer base, right, from the Atlantic Coast Conference to the Pac-12 and to the uh, Midwest, right? And so you're kind of watching that in front of your face, and it's going to evolve over these years, and they're going to ask themselves, what do we need the NCAA for? And that's going to be like the like as these teams start to like morph into these two conferences, uh, the SEC being what they are, and then the rest of the world morphing into what they are. Uh, the the NCAA's um, effect is going to be minimized, and these people are going to sign direct TV contracts, and they're going to play their own games. And uh, I think there'll always be a there, there'll be a thing, but I think just the the the, the, the enforcement that they had before to sort of be like the hammer on on side of all of college athletics. I think that's going, you know, you'll look back 20 years from now, you'll see, you know, in 2021, whenever this ruling came out, that this was the birth of it, you know what I'm saying? And like somebody talked, somebody talked about Spencer Haywood, somebody talked about Maurice Claret, then they'll talk about 2021 and all of the other people who were a part of like trying to make things happen and change. And there, there was a ton of people before me, I'm not mentioning my name, I'm just mentioning the people that I know. Uh, but uh, this will be the start of it, of like the NCAA not being as important as it was before. If you look at record labels now, you can, you can shoot a video and upload it and you don't need a record label to put your music out. You can put 
a movie out if you want to. And and the world is changing, you know what I'm saying? And the world is going to be uh, like that, you know, where you can just kind of control your own destiny. That's what these conferences are going to do. All right. Excellent stuff, you all. Thank you so much for um, sharing your time and your expertise with us this evening. We appreciate all of our panelists. Um, and thank you so much for to our guests for attending tonight. Um, we encourage each of you to click on the Drake Group links in the chat just to learn more about the organization and what we do and how you can uh, support our efforts as well. Um, and do keep an eye on your inboxes for more information about our future webinars. And that's going to do it for tonight. Thank you all so much and have a good one. Thank you.